Welcome to Auntie K's, your favorite radical queer indigenous auntie bringing you tarot every day. Hello everyone and welcome to Auntie K's Tarot. So today I want to talk about the nine and ten of swords. They are the last two deacons of Gemini. They cover uh, May 31st to uh, June 9th and June 10th to uh, 20th. And I am talking about these cards today because the Nine of Swords is uh, is my birth card. Uh, it represents my birthday. It's the deacon that represents my birthday, followed by the Ten of Swords, which is the deacon that represents uh, my adoption day, the day I was uh, officially adopted in the 60s scoop. As you can see, these are very close together. I was um, taken from my mom at two days old, and I was adopted when I was seven days old in the 60s scoop. Um, it has always seemed really on point to me that my, uh, the card representing my birthday and my adoption day are the nine and 10 of swords. They are probably the two minor cards people are most concerned about receiving. The Nine of Swords, and here I'm using Fortune Queens, and then here is the Land Back Tarot. The Fortune Queens is by Juano Cristiano, and uh, the Land Back Tarot is by me. Um, so traditionally, in the Nine of Swords, we see a person, uh, you know, sitting up in their bed, in despair, anxiety, struggling with sleep from their nightmares. And in the Nine of Weapons for the Land Back Tarot, um, <clears throat> I depicted uh, your nightmares coming over the horizon into reality. In the Ten of Swords, we frequently see somebody with a bunch of swords in their back. In Fortune Queens, uh, we see a grave instead. Um, in, in the Ten of Weapons, I depicted the Trail of Tears. And these, to me, uh, suited these very well. The sword suit also, uh, you know, it has to do with our, with our voice, with speaking. It represents air signs. And 8, 9, and 10 uh, represent Gemini, who is ruled by Mercury. And um, I feel this is relevant in the cards I depicted as... Uh, both bring an end to uh, telling your own story and having your own voice. Um, I depicted our nightmares coming to life because often the things that keep us up at night that we are worried about, we are told it's all in your head. But for most marginalized people, those fears in our head are a reality that has breached the horizon for uh, too many of our own kin. And therefore that fear, while it speaks in our head and it brews in our head, it is based in reality and in real lived experiences and uh, you know, the possibility of a, a real fear, uh, a real end. And so it was important to me to make it more real in that way, to acknowledge that these fears that we are afraid are about to breach the horizon 
are, they do have a basis in reality. We aren't being kept up late at night uh, by our imaginations alone, but by what our imaginations are doing with the real world informations we are living through. The tens in tarot are conclusions, but a lot of the time we've really reached the conclusion of that suit in the nine and the 10 is like that final conclusion, complete ending and beginning of a new story, a new history. Um, it, it's an, they're, they end and something new begins. And this is very evident in the sword suit. Being a 60s scoop survivor and being removed from my mother, from my family, from my community, from my language, and from my culture seems fitting for this. Uh, it probably was not my nightmare in my imagination as a newborn, but it certainly was a fear sitting in the mind of my mother as I came into this world, as I spent um, my first and only day with her, my first and only 24 hours with her. I'm sure I felt her fear and anxiety and her worries. And then it reached the horizon and I experienced it. And I was marched, not marched, I was driven in a car across state lines, international lines, provincial lines. And given a new history and separated from my origins. And so this seems really fitting. Um, this separation from our origins began with the Trail of Tears, continued through the residential school system, and then through the 60s scoop. A lot of people think of the 60s scoop as being a Canadian thing, but the Americans did it also. Up until 1978, when they passed a law known as ICWA, or the Indigenous or, or the Indian Child Welfare Act, <clears throat> ICWA is currently in the Supreme Court of the United States to be overturned. Hopefully, that fails, but. The conservative Supreme Court judges are buying the story of the uh, oil law firm, oil law firm lawyers representing the white people, arguing that it is racist that ICWA stops the removal of indigenous children and prevents white people from adopting them and uh, raising them to be assimilated into whiteness. And that's exactly what it is. It is genocide under the uh, Section 2 uh, E of the UN Convention Against Genocide, the forcible removal of uh, children from one culture or group into another. And uh, transracial adoptees can confirm what scoop survivors who are also transracial adoptees can tell you that uh, being adopted is a trauma. Psychologists will back this up. Being adopted is a trauma that traumatizes you for life. Nine in 10 of sorts. And when it becomes transracial, it is genocide. Um, 
And some of you might think it is not fair to call it genocide when it's not indigenous children being transracially adopted. But when you consider how it happens on a mass scale, whether it's indigenous children in the Americas or black children in the Americas or, you know, brown children from the rest of the world being adopted by North Americans, white North Americans, you see that it is no different than the 60s scoop. Transracial adoption is wrong. There is a reason that, you know, 99% of all transracially adopting parents are white. There's a reason this is done by white people, and that's because it is genocide. And I've gone on a really, really personal note here. Um... But this is the nine and ten of swords. I think we, uh, I think we like to make it more palatable, just like with the death card. It's more palatable if we call death a transition. And while I spiritually believe that death is a transition. It is still death. It is still an end. It is an end to the life that we know and understand in a passing into an unknown that we know nothing about. So now we are looking at each of these deacons with the majors that uh, speak to them. Being ruled by Gemini, uh, the lovers, is uh, an aspect of each of these deacons. In the Nine of Swords, the deacons are the tower and the lovers. This is a card that is known as the Lord of Cruelty and um, also as uh, angels and demons. And... It is seen as a punishment for, uh, you know, choosing freedom, choosing individuality, choosing for yourself, choosing against fascism or oppression. Eve in the RWS chooses uh, the apple and uh, is punished for it and everything she knows you know, falls away, if you believe that. Um, but if we look at it from this perspective, you know, Eve chose knowledge. She chose to stand up against oppression and fascism and uh, choose knowledge, choose the truth, um, and choose to decide for herself. And in reality, there is nothing white supremacy hates more than that. And um, from that, we see those uh, worst fears cross over the horizon. And uh, bring us into the Ten of Swords, um, whose majors are the Lovers and the Sun. And it is known as um, the Last Words. It is the Lord of Ruin. And while the Sun can often be this uh, beautiful card, if you have been cast out of a garden, end up in the desert, in the blazing sun. I don't know biblically if that's where they ended up. I don't care about what's in a garden. But you end up in the blazing sun and uh, it is too hot and 
uh, you are starting this entire new life uh, from the choices you have made, the choice to stand up, the choice to choose to uh, love yourself, uh, which brings us to the sort of conclusion that I have here, which is the solution in the Nine and Ten of Swords is to continue to love yourself and to continue to choose to stand up despite certain uh, cruelty and ruin because that is coming anyway. That is coming anyway. I sort of imagine that Eve would have been punished for even speaking to the snake and being interested in knowledge or having been exposed to it. Your, your only choice is to love yourself. It is your sur only survival in uh, ruin and cruelty and death and ends. Um, and this has been a hard lesson for me. From my birthday to my adoption day every year, I feel like a train wreck. Um, I, I just feel like a train wreck. And, um, my birthday plans this year did not go as planned. Some of my kids were coming home to visit and there was epic, uh, ride car issues and um they didn't make it and it was nobody's fault and it to me just felt very inevitable and um it was a hard week <laughs> And I kept thinking about talking about these cards and um, I could do it in my head really well, but doing it out loud was really hard. Saying those final words was incredibly hard. And all I could choose to do was to love myself and to force myself on each day. <clears throat> I think the hardest thing for me in these cards are descriptions that whitewash these cards. Descriptions that put these cards into a perspective of privilege where it's really not all that bad, where uh, it's all in your head and uh, the final end is nothing more than a uh, transition and you will be fine and you will go on to uh, a new suit and everything will be amazing. Uh, and you learned all these great lessons. Woohoo! And um, while I think that might be the feeling from the nine to ten of wands where you're worn out and exhausted, but have, you know, largely been successful through the whole suit, uh, it's not really the same here. Um, these really can be devastating moments and I think it's useful when they come up to explore the realities of those underlining fears and worries and to acknowledge that um, nothing will be the same after. And that it might leave a permanent scar. And how 
are you going to choose yourself through um, these moments that are out of your control and in the control of others? And really, this is something we need to understand about uh, oppression and the experiences of those of us who are marginalized. That um, the ten of swords doesn't just, uh, you know, flip over to become an ace of another suit. Um, that the Ten of Swords is an end. And in the Nine of Swords, you are facing it with everything you've got. And it is really hard to love yourself in that if you are told it is all in your head. Because if you are told it is all in your head, then it is your own damn fault. And that's not the truth of it. Um, that, that's just not the truth of it. And, um, I think I really needed to make this video for me. Let's wrap this up, um, in a different perspective. Um, I did get some lovely gifts. Uh, if you follow my channel, you know I got the uh, Black and Gold Lenormand by Grandma Baby's Apothecary as a gift to myself. And it arrived a bit before my birthday. And at first I thought, oh no, <laughs> I'm going to struggle with this so much. And, um... The images and the changes weren't easy, uh, so I labeled it for myself, and then I did a reading on this channel and was told, just use it. <laughs> so I've just been using it, uh, and it's gone really well. Uh, my The spirits definitely are picky as to who they are going to use this deck for. Um, and they have not told me to reach for this deck for a white client ever. <laughs> uh, just occasionally for uh, BIPOC clients, primarily black clients. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, and not all of them, but yeah, some. And um, this deck is feeling very special, um, even though it is just called to be used on occasion. Although I do frequently uh, pull three or five cards for a, a single insight or question uh, in a reading. I also really like the neutrality of uh, the client and uh, person of interest or uh, personal goals or questions card, which would be this one, subject or person. Um, the neutrality of that is really great. Uh, I also got the um, Malefique Lenormand by Gindem, by Gindman. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It is by US Games, came in a two-part box, came with a little booklet, which basically just has keywords. So... Uh, this is a deck that I think is going to be good for creepy season. Uh, all the animals are kind of creepy, which I don't know how I feel about. Um, I mostly like the pictures. Um, 
Some of them are absolutely hard to read. I uh, rats for the mice kind of uh, uh, creeps me out. Um, <clears throat> the people cards don't really look human, but the woman particularly still looks white. That's the man. This is the birds. Um, it's one of the ones that's definitely hard to see the birds in it. Whereas the fish came out really clear. The stork, I can see it more now than I could at the beginning of the week. So that is that deck. It, I like it. It is... Um, longer uh the border on the end makes it bigger than a lenormand card it uh just fits into these spaces for me so works for me all right i also got under the roses um let's just look so it came with an option of uh, for the lady, the gentleman, and the child of a black person or a white person. This always confused. And then everybody else is white except for the snake. I, you know, alternate cards is one thing. But when the alternate cards are like, oh, you know, you don't. We don't need to make your get deck gay, but you could make your deck gay if you include this card. Or we don't, you don't have to have a diverse deck, but if you want some diversity in a deck, okay, we'll give that to you. When this is the only brown person other than the optional brown people cards that you don't have to have in your deck. It's so problematic. It's so problematic. And yet it is really pretty and really clear. None of these three decks have what I really like. A playing card insert. Um... But it is this really nice and gorgeous deck. It is useless uh, for reading for anyone other than a straight person. But thankfully, my other decks have options. Yes, I could have the men and women white cards on hand to trade them out. But I'd rather choose one of my other decks for that purpose. Um... And it's a birthday gift. Uh, I can make this deck work for me, but I am not giving this creator props for their optional diversity. It is by Kendra Hurtu and Katrina Hill. Uh, yeah, optional diversity <laughs> is not something you get props for. It's a really centrist or neoliberal take. And uh, no props. But I like the deck. Uh, and there's one more deck coming in the mail uh, for my birthday also. And it also does this. But you get an option of a white person, a black person, or a white person in rainbows. <sighs> um, I, I'm still excited for these gifts and folks did their best to find diverse Lenormand decks for me. My kids did their best. And I really do like them and will use them. And... I also got uh, this book by Angela Sturette, My Fight for Survival, Hope and Justice for Indigenous Women and Girls. 
Unbroken. This is a book by a scoop survivor like myself. And um, they, you know, talk about the stories and lives of uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women. And um, Angela Sturet is an award-winning investigative journalist and author from the Gidden Max community of Gitskan Nation nation on her father's side and from Bell Island, Newfoundland on her mother's side. Strett has worked as a television, radio, and digital journalist for more than a decade. She is the host of the CBC original podcast, Land Back, investigating land theft and ran land reclamation in Canada. She lives on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tisleil-Waututh uh, nations. And, um, so I am, uh, you know, working through this book really slowly given, um, given how close this book is to my reality written by Scoop Survivor about missing and murdered Indigenous people my sister who is also adopted in the scoop um is one of these missing and murdered indigenous people and um so you know it's it's a lot and i am reading it slowly and I think if I can read this as somebody traumatized by these two very things, then um, the rest of you can read it too. And uh, perhaps it will connect you to the harder readings of the Nine and Ten of Swords. All right, that's all, folks. Talk to you later.